Anyone that would like to join the ladies and light the candles? We want to do that now. And it's on the front panel if you, uh, if you need it. Yes, the prayers for thank the you for that. Well, <laughs> well, I was going to be your audience, but I guess not, huh? Oh, no. Oh, no. We don't need an audience. <laughs> Oh, what they do is, on the front panel, did you get a program? On the front panel, we do the lighting of the candles, so the ladies say a prayer in English and in Hebrew, and it's on your front panel. Yeah. the Shema. It's on your front panel as well. So we'll start by singing it in Hebrew, then we'll recite it in English. <laughs>
the church calendar is Father's Day. Because our Heavenly Father's love, there's nothing like it. Amen. You know, when I first <laughs> fell in love with Jesus, I was so in love with Jesus. I didn't know about the deep ministry of the Holy Spirit. I didn't know about our Heavenly Father's love. I was raised in a family where my father wasn't loved when he was growing up, and so he didn't show love in a way that was meaningful to any of us, but he provided for us, so that was love. So I knew that part of the father, the provider, but I didn't know the father. And I was in this Bible school, and they invited this lovely man, Dr. Robert Frost, who had written a book called Our Heavenly Father, and he came, he was just soft-spoken and gentle, and he just began to talk about the love of the Father. And Janet, I had one of those moments where my breath, I was like, I couldn't breathe. My chest was like, oh my gosh, what is this? So after the whole meeting was over, all the kids had scurried, and there's just a few, and I went up to him, and I'm just weeping. I said, I don't know. He said, oh, that's the love. That's the love of the Father. He said, I want you to go this afternoon and just rest with the Father and experience his love for you. And you know, that day changed me forever. I think that was the only reason I ever went to that school, was to hear that man. Because the rest of what they taught wasn't that great. <laughs> so you know what you do, you major on the major and minor on the minors, yeah. chew the meat, spit out the bones. And that's what I learned to do. And I, over my all these years in the desert in these churches, I had the privilege of being around some amazing fathers. And Bruce Underwood is a father. He is a spiritual father. And I loved him as my friend and as a spiritual father. And all these wonderful men God used in my life to show me the love of the Father. So I want to end with this song. It's a little obscure. Um, it's been out for a few years. But... There was a spirit-filled priest that wrote this book. And basically, it's getting up and saying in the morning, good morning, Abba. You know? And so these young people wrote this song. They have a missionary organization, and they read that book, Good Morning, Abba, and they were forever changed. So they wrote this song. Reality. 
I think what we take away tonight is Abba's love. And it was it was beautiful. Thomas, thank mm -hmm. you as always, always catching, always sets the tone for us. And uh, since I'm not teaching on the partial, but what I'm teaching on I think very much fits, we won't let go of that. But just to give you a synopsis of where we are in our parsha, we've got our children of Israel that have come up close to the edge now of the promised land. So we've actually made movement. Believe it or not, we've been moving. <laughs> and it's controversial as to how this opening means. It's called parsha, that's the portion, shalach lecha. And it means stand for yourself. But the controversy is whether God was saying to Moshe, send for yourself, do this, put out, send the spies, or was he, and in a godly way, because he's only God, how do I say only God? <laughs> he's God only, I don't know how to say it the right way, but the, the intent, some say that they were having this conversation God did not feel the need for them to send the spies in and learn what the land, the inhabitants of the land, what they were like. God had already told them he was going to, to cast out seven nations in front of them. So it was more in, in a, a holy way that the fed up attitude, well then send for yourself. If that's what you think you need to do, then just do it. So our, our rabbis are people who love to be like our rabbis, you know, if you've got three Jews, you've got four opinions. <laughs> Go at it and pull it apart. Whichever way you want to look at it, I cannot stand here and say, well, I know dogmatically it's this way. But I will fully agree with that thought. They didn't need to worry. They didn't need to be concerned. But God could have been directing them what they needed to do so that they would see. Because God, when he prepares us for a test, he does prepare us. He doesn't just throw us in and then expect us to figure it out. So it could be either way. But what our children of Israel should have realized, rather than looking at the size of the enemy, and we'll get to that point in a moment, in the last 13 months that they've been traveling, they've had the, the miraculous deliverance from Egypt. They've had their experiences at Mount Sinai, which were literally earth shattering. You know, the mountains shook, the fire, the smoke, the sound, everything. They had the Torah given, and at that time, they entered into covenant with God. It became personal, upfront, and where to believe that we stood there with them, that that covenant comes right down to us as if we were that first generation. They've had the Levitical priesthood put into motion. The priests to represent God to the people, and the people have a chance to relate to God and to relate to God through this. The, even the 12 tribes were taught to form the cross around the Mishkan when they would camp. They had the Shekinah glory. That's tangible. They could see that in the pillar of cloud by day, the fire by night, mm -hmm. and also over the Holy of Holies when they would camp. That's nothing small. I tell Lord all the time, I want to see that. Be mm -hmm. me up. I, I want to be in the midst of that. I've had tastes. I think we've all had tastes, and I want more. <laughs> So on their way to the promised land, really, their faith should have been growing, they should have been strengthening, there should not have been a fear of the enemies that they were going to face. God had been faithful to feed them, and if you want to talk about miracles, mock from heaven every day. Double the portion every day before Shabbat. Nothing on Shabbat, but yet what they had from the day before wasn't spoiled the next day. I mean, every week they were seeing this. Every day they were seeing it. They were picking it up and they were feeding themselves and they had all the water they needed and their clothes aren't wearing out and their shoes aren't off, off their feet. You know, it's just, you, you've got to just wonder why they were so quick to be so fearful. I'm going to say we haven't walked a mile in their moccasins or in their sandals. <laughs> but still, I just really wonder as I looked at this and I thought about it and then, Moshe renames Hosea to Yehoshea, Joshua in our English, but uh, again, controversy as to why. We'll ask God one day, but it definitely makes his name mean the Lord will save or the Lord saves. So was Moshe trying to point them to that, that you're going forward with the Lord, the Lord will save you? Maybe that was his intent. But all we know is we've got our spies gone for 40 days and 10 come back out of 12 with 
a terrible report. You know, they're too big, they're too many, they're too much, I bet, you know. And, and they cause the people to fear. The majority feared. And uh, yet they came back with the blessings of the land too. They, some say that uh, there was uh, a cluster of grapes so large that it took even eight to carry it back. I'd only heard two before, but one of my sources said eight to carry it back. They had a pomegranate that was giant size. They had one fig that was huge. And I know from what I've seen in Israel, they grow large in Israel. The fruits and the vegetables are amazing in size, and they are delicious. So they were being told, it's a land of milk and honey. It's a land God's promised you. And thankfully, Yahshua and Caleb, Joshua and Caleb, did step up and say, you know, we can do this. We've got the Lord on our side. But they were so afraid of the, the giants that... And here's where I just can't understand, but I, I think of mob mentality. And if you get the few started, the group kind of takes that on. And they became so afraid. They'd been murmuring. They'd been complaining. They had been, you know, all this before. And seeing God deal with it so many different ways. But still, here at this time in this parasha, they're, we're going to fall by the sword. Our wives and our little ones will be pray for them. It'd be better to go back to Egypt. And that's where I think, really? <laughs> really? It'd be better to go back to slavery? Back to being, having taskmasters that are so harsh that, that your people are dying off from that? Really? That would be better? And then they didn't even just say that and didn't just complain, but they picked up stones. You know what they were going to do with those stones? They were going to stone Moshe and Aharon to death, raise up a new leader who would take them back to Egypt. That's, wow. You talk about getting off track. That's amazing. And that's when the Lord said, and we do know this was a test for Moshe, but he rightfully said, you know, basically, Moshe, get out of the way. I'm going to strike them with pestilence. I'm going to disinherit them, and I'll make you a greater and a better nation. You know, and, and at that moment, I, it shows me how much Moshe had grown in the Lord. Because why he didn't say, I'll go for that one. Yeah. I'll take yeah. that deal. <laughs> I'm done with them. Here and he's trying to get them to follow the Lord and want to stone them to death and go back to Egypt. And yet he intercedes. I see the love of a father in Moshe. Well, there's one of our men, the prodigal son. Really? <laughs> Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> so um, Moshe interceded for the children of Israel instead of what you would expect. Instead of him saying, I'm fed up with them too. You no, know, he stepped in and he, as a good father, even though they weren't his blood children, they were, he was like the father to them. And he did um, say to the Lord, you know, if you do this, the enemies are going to say that you are a weak God. You couldn't keep the people in the, the desert. And it'd be bad for your name. So don't do that. You know? And um, Moshe in that moment passed the test of God seeing where his heart was, what he was going to do, where his reliance was, who he was going to be faithful to. And yet, uh, there was a great consequence to pay. And we know we're going to have 40 more, well, almost 40 more years now. We're going to have 38 plus years more because it will be 40 years before they cross over into the promised land, even though they're right at the edge and could have gone in. God says, okay, those in unbelief, they're out. The young ones, I'll raise them up and they will go in. And so God keeps his faithful word to the nth degree. He had promised he will deliver. But uh, it's a sad time for our children of Israel. It was great consequence that they're going to deal with the rest of their lives. And there is a double play on the words for the spying in the end when God gave the directions for the seat seat, which are the fringes on the um, shawl that they were, or the, what do I call it? Janet, help me. Um, Talib? Talib. Talib, thank you. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm thinking the undergarment, but yes, totally it is yes. more accurate. Yeah, that the, the, the four corners, you know, they were to have these fringes and what it was to remind them of. But the double play was that they were not to spy after. They were not to let their eyes spy out. And it, in essence, what it's saying in that double play is we need to have blinders on also. That we not spy out the things of the world mm -hmm. and allow them to entice us away from the view of remembering our God. So that's a heavy lesson for us to learn from this lesson. Or half to our, our portion after the Torah where we deal with the prophets. In this time, we again have spies being sent in, but this time they didn't send in 12, they sent in two, only two. We have uh, Kalaf came up, go again, and Phineas, who was of the priestly um, group that had shown himself to be a great godly character, they met Rahab, Rahab, not a woman whose reputation you would think would be good, but she had heard about this God. She, we know, had a heart. We all know the story, so I'm not telling you the whole story, but when Jericho, Jericho falls, we know she's going to put the scarlet cord outside of her window, and her portion of the wall will not fall. She will not uh, be crushed to death. She and her family, whoever's within that, um, that it, within her house, would be safe. If that's not a miracle, what is? You know, it's just full of miracles, and she gets to be the great grandmother to Malchavi, to King David. So, God is not a, a. You have to be of a certain class or a certain type, and He's not one who cannot forgive the past. There's so much we can learn. And then when we go into our Brit Chadashah this week, it brings it home, and it was warning our Hebrew people, and we take it to us to this day: Do not sin the sin of unbelief. Walk in your faith. Trust your God. Don't be disobedient. Don't follow the example of those who perished in the wilderness. Go for it with your God. So it's a jam-packed <laughs> parsha. That, that's trying to do that in a nutshell. And to see that at the same time tied into our timing, into this weekend that, that we do look at those relationships. And again, I... I encourage you, look at the godly relationship, not at an earthly relationship that can never hold a candle to uh, what our God and His love is like. And I think we can honor it in no better way than for me to finish off our priestly blessing, the ironic blessing that we have been talking about for the last two weeks. And we only have the one phrase left. I'm still going to do a very quick review that in it, it's such a picture of the Father's love that I thought this is the ideal weekend to sum it all up. So just by way of reminder, it comes out of the Midbar, Numbers chapter 6 and verse 27. And it says, in this way they're to put my name on the people of Israel so that I will bless them. And we talk about how this is the only prayer that we have from the Father, from Jehovah Father in heaven. And what he is putting onto his people and it would be every day in the morning as they were to go out after dealing with the time in the temple, the sacrifices, the prayers, that this prayer would be placed on them as they go out to work for the day. And that name that God was saying to put on them, that name was the very person, the very character, the very power and authority of our God. That's huge. You know, when... Uh, and today not everyone wants to, but when women would marry and take the husband's name, it was to be a strong name for them. It was to bring them under that protection and under that, that shield. And I see God putting his name on in that way, that it was to be power for them and authority mm -hmm. and all that his character. And as we move through this and especially get into the ending of it tonight, we will see that character that he was placing on each and every one that we carry forward because that prayer is still prayed over us to this very day. It's not that it ended back in Bible times. It has continued. We saw that, that um, we were to lift up holy hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. And we talked about how the priest made the form with, with his fingers. And again, I'm not good at it because my hands are... are bent, but to look like the letter Shem, Sheen, which stands for our God, the window being where his glory would come through, all of this, the lifting up of the hands and everything to just 
just in essence give the people a visual that would show and make them feel that here comes a flood of the glory of the Lord and it would come right upon them. And uh, we saw that that um, emblem also stood for Shaddai, uh, God Almighty, God the Nurturer, God the Nourisher. Again, I could do a whole night on Shaddai, on mm -hmm. that word alone. We see in this uh, priestly blessing that the name Yehovah is used. It's substituted by Adonai because our people are afraid they do not know how to pronounce. Is it Yahweh? Is it Yehovah? How do we say it right? And out of fear and respect, they punt back to Adonai because they know how to say it. But when he's putting that name on it, he in essence is saying the I am is praying for you and blessing you. And the I am, again, I could do another whole night on I am and not exhaust it and not even ever fully comprehend because it's, it's just beyond our finite minds to understand that, that continual, that was, that is, that will be, that, that is all of that at once and still I've got to get a couple more levels outside of that. When I figure out how, I'll let you know. <laughs> and I have a feeling you'll know with me because we're going to be home when we get to that. But God was t telling us that he was putting his name on us. At this time, it's on the children of Israel. We know that we are his children when we come into that right relationship with him. So we can apply. We can see it. And Hebrews tells us that we are to, to let us offer God a sacrifice of praise continually. That that's the natural product of our lips is to acknowledge his name. That's why we want to talk about his name. We want to see it and understand it in all its glory. And if you're ever around me and you know I get any chance to talk on the names of God, I will lose it every time because there's just so much depth and meaning. And it's just if you want to be especially blessed and feel that relationship come closer and closer, I encourage you. Take a name. Take a name for a week, one of God's names from the scripture, and just study that one name, and then watch how God uses that name in your world during that week. It's amazing. Tonight, though, we're finishing up our three-in-one priestly blessing because it's three phrases, and we also see that the divine name, Jehovah, is given three times, so they call it the three-in-one. And we know that everything good comes from the Father in heaven, that uh, he, there's no variableness, there's no shadow, there's no turning. This is our God. So when we started it with may the Lord, may Yahweh, Yahovah, however you want to say it, may he in those attributes that are reflected in that name alone show his mercy and his grace. That's where it starts. His mercy and his grace, and that's what he's going to share on you to bless you. In that blessing, the barucha, that you're given that blessing, you will see it in the material world, but more importantly, you'll see it in the spiritual prosperity. And as he blesses you spiritually, the idea is that's why you can pursue the study of his word and learn from his word and grasp some of the depth of it that the picture given to us, and I brought it out in much more detail, that's why I'm hurrying through it now, the picture was of the father who is now kneeling down in front of his child. He's on his child's level so they can see eye to eye. So the little one doesn't feel like there's this giant. He's seeing the father. He's seeing, when he looks in his eyes, the eyes of love. I'm suddenly reminded of my mom's mom, who was not given to this. This was not the norm. It's the one time in her life that, that she had this happen. And without going into the, the circumstances of taking the time, it was at a time that her life was in jeopardy due to her health. And she so felt the need for the Lord. And she was praying. And the Lord appeared to her. And all she could ever say about it was, oh, that was all she could ever convey to the family, those eyes. And I think she saw the, the love in those eyes. It met her in, in what her need was at that time. She lived on five more years and raised her children a little younger. My mom was still only 12 when she lost her mom. But what a blessing that God brought this into that home at that time. 
but this one who is our creator, who is the creator of the universe, who is concerned with how many people at the same moment, and anybody who's a mom of a few kids or a teacher of 30 in a classroom knows how challenging it is to be there for the few, let alone God's hearing in languages and situations from crisis to praising, from things upside down to things right side up, from people upside down <laughs> who aren't falling off, <coughs> figure that one out. <laughs> and they're not sticking out sideways either. <laughs> and he's keeping, and then he's kneeling before one, each one. And he's there to bestow on that one whatever they need to gift them. We talked about how God wants to and gives everyone gifts. That we we may say, well, he hasn't given me a gift. Yes, he has. And if you don't know it, you need to be in prayer with him to discover the gift or gifts he has given you. And what you do with your gift or gifts is your gift to him. He has blessed you. Are you using it? We talked about all kinds of different shapes and sizes those gifts can come in and they can... Uh, be different at different times in your life, but you are never giftless. He is always kneeling before you, blessing you afresh and anew, pouring out on you in the material, yes, but more importantly, in the spiritual. And oh, just knowing that. Then he says he's going to keep you. And we talked about how that's on two levels also. That it's the sheep that, that the thorn bushes are all around for their fold that night so that nothing can get to them without coming through thorny bushes first, <clears throat> that protection and that safety. That is that kind of keep, but it's also the kind of keep that's cultivating, nurturing, growing you. That That's your, yes, your refuge and your strength, but it's also blessing you in your mind and your soul and your spirit. And, and then you see he alone is your security in more than just a physical way. But he is your spiritual security too. He holds you. He keeps you. It's not that we do it. He does it for us. We move from a physical position of seeing our protection, our safety, into more of the emotional and the mental. And we saw in that second phrase, the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. We saw it really could be in the plural, yet it was one saying it. And remember, this is a personalized prayer. It is spoken to one individual in the way it is written. It's not spoken to a group to be for a group. It's to be to each one of you individually. And you're to see all the things is a God, every facet in every way, and at the same time, I think it stands for the three, the, the face of our Father, our Son, and our Ruach HaKodesh, our Holy Spirit. We saw that third person omniscient is the one who knows it all. That's why he's called omniscient. He's telling the, the story. The Father's telling us the prayer because he's the one that knows it all. And in this, we saw so much in the face that we seek his face. And when you look in that face of love, when you look in that face of strength, when you look in that face of knowledge, of security, of whatever it is you need, your fears are gone. What you lack is gone. You know that that face shows you everything that you need and that you want. And we talked about it even in our humanity that we see the face of a bride for her groom or the groom for her bride, looking for that first glimpse at that moment on that special day. And then think, what are we called today? The called out assembly, the church is called the bride of Christ. Our groom is waiting for us there at that altar. The first glimpse we'll get as we come home because he comes out to meet us and take us home. Wow, I could park here for an hour and not bore us, I think, a bit. But I'll move on and I will tell you that it's also a picture of this one lifting up his whole countenance, bringing everything that he is to that one that he's knelt in front of to meet them. Everything that he has, he's willing to give to that one and I think yes because God gave God God provided God nothing else could meet our need we needed the holy God on the holy level 
And that's what he is showing us when it says, and we studied it at Passover time, that God would provide the lamb. And we looked and went back to the Akita to Abraham offering up Yitzhak. And when Yitzhak, Isaac asked, Dad, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham's poignant words, so prophetic and so much more than what meets the face, God himself will provide. And God will provide himself. God gave us God. Wrap your mind around that one and come out of that and tell me you're not loved and you're not cared for and that you're not getting a new level and a new glimpse of what this blessing really means. This is the one who it says that, um, and I have to read it to get it, make his face to shine upon you, that shining, that light. We looked at it as a noun. We looked at it as a verb. We looked at it illuminating. We looked at the fact that that's what we say wisdom does. Remember the light bulb that goes on in the cartoon? Ding! Oh, we're bright now. We've got the idea. And here is again the Shekinah glory illuminating. The wisdom of God that he's saying, I'm kneeling down here to give it to you. Do you lack in wisdom? Ask me and I'll give it to you. What? Wow. Big vocabulary here. Wow. <laughs> Moving on quickly to be gracious of you. We saw in that graciousness is, is grace and it's favor. It's everything we don't deserve and not getting everything we do deserve. And we looked and stopped at the fact that this blessing was given to us, or given to our children of Israel originally, very shortly after the episode of the Golden Calf. They couldn't have been further off then. I think they couldn't have been further off than in our parasha today, ready to stone Moshe and Haron and go back to Egypt. Thank God he didn't let them carry that out, that they were stopped. But here in this, in bringing this graciousness to you, we saw him as Jehovah Yira, the provider, the one who would provide everything. And in Hebrew, we saw that this was paralleled with words that meant healing, help being lifted up, finding refuge, strength, rescue, protection in so many ways and so many levels. And we saw that then how could anything separate us from the love of God? And we went through Romans 8, 38 and 39 and saw the depth and the height and the, and I think even right now I'm trying to wrap my mind around how much love that is. It is deeper than the ocean. It's taller than the tallest mountain. It's wider than the widest sea that you think you've got to cross. And remember when they made it across the sea, God just simply part of it, dry land, took them across in one night. It was at least three miles wide of a split for the number of people to get across in one night. They didn't get stuck in mud. They didn't get showered on. They didn't come through soaked. And yet what happened immediately behind them is an entire Egyptian army is trapped. Who's your enemy? What's your problem? <laughs> Just ask God to travel, and he will. We saw as we moved on, may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. We saw now he's dealing with the spirit of the man. And that's what's going to end with that shalom. It, this, this is really what's in the spirit. But in the Hebrew word for this lift up, it's to bear up, it's to carry, it's to lift. I see the perfect picture of Mama Eagle who has had to kick her little ones out of the nest. She can't leave them in that nest forever. They're going to outgrow that nest and they're going to not know all the wonders that those little wings that they have can carry them to and they're going to learn how to find food for themselves and all. But when she kicks them out and they're fluttering and they're going down, she's scooping under and she's lifting them up putting them back into the nest safely, nourishing them, putting her wings around them again. They feel the warmth and the safety. And I think, what a picture again in our priestly blessing do we not see Mama Eagle with her little babies teaching them to fly. When you want to say, God, why are you doing this? Realize he's saying, flap your wings. Look what I've got for you. You want to soar. Do you really want to stay down with the 
the little grubby things on the ground, or do you want to soar and see the sights that I have for you? I hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard what God has prepared for you. Oh, wow, this should have lifted them up and carried them. They should have walked out to go to their jobs or whatever they were to do. Light, like they were walking on clouds by this point. And it's not over yet because we're bringing it home now with and give you shalom, give you peace. When we see this in picture form, it's like a perfectly set table. The whole setting is there. The, the plate, the silver, the goblet, everything is there. I think about Eliyahu. I think of when we at Passover have that place ready for him. And we don't do it justice because this picture, it's set for royalty. And everything's there and just waiting for the person to come in. And it's as if that's what the Lord says. I have a place for you. I've prepared it for you. I've set the table for you. And when you see that, you know the food is coming. You all know the story about keeping the fork, don't you? The woman who loved to go to the church potlucks, and she said to her pastor, he would he'd come to her side. She knew she was soon to be home with the Lord, and she wanted him to do her service. So he had come to talk with her, and she said, you know, I, I want you, and I'm trying to remember how she phrased it, but she said, you know, tell them, tell them uh, to keep the fork. And he looked at her and it's like, what are you saying? She says, oh, that's my favorite part. When they're clearing off the table and they tell you, keep your fork, you know desserts come. <laughs> <laughs> so she said, I'm going home. I'm going to my dessert. Tell them, keep the fork. The best is yet to come. And that's what he shared at her homegoing service for her. And God has set everything for you. He doesn't have to scramble. He doesn't have to push someone out of the way. He has a fully prepared meal for you. And I even hear Psalm 23. He sets the table for me in the presence of my enemies. If our children of Israel could have said in the presence of these enemies, Yeshua and Caleb tried to say, they're bread us. We'll eat them up. They were saying, oh, we're the old grasshoppers. They're huge giants. And they said, we can eat them up. Like hamantashen. Remember, we eat our enemy. We eat them up. They're gone. We stomp them out. If they could have only walked in that faith. If they could have only realized the words God's putting on them every day. He's there to bless them, to transform them, to... to fashion them into a new countenance because as this is happening, that countenance of his, that Shekhinah glory will be spilling over on them and they will be reflecting that. They'll take on his aura in, in that way. And this shalom, this peace is that complete peace. This isn't just a simple word. This isn't just the, the hello and goodbye. This is the peace that is on every level. It's as if there's not just simply no strife, but there is a perfect balance, a perfect harmony between the finite and the infinite, between the temporal and the eternal, between the material and the spiritual. Everything is in sync. Everything is the way it belongs. Everything has been so touched by our God that it's all at rest. It's all in shalom. If you don't have shalom, it really doesn't matter what else you have. Because you can't appreciate it, enjoy it, move in it, react with it when you don't have that peace. And I think that's why that's the seal on the prayer. I've given you all of this. And here's the crescendo. My shalom. So you can enjoy it, walk in it, move in it, have it be your being. As you see all of this, it will give you that shalom. And in this shalom is also the idea of no deficiency. And I wish Bruce were here for that tonight. Because he could talk to us and tell us the vitamin deficiencies. You know, as soon as he hears someone's got an ailment, oh, they're lacking something. This is the, you're not going to lack on any level. You're not going to lack physically, materially, spiritually. God is giving you everything. He is your shalom. 
you're sound, you're safe, you're secure, but you're also complete. He sees us as that finished work. I'll tell you, I'm a work in progress. I see, I see all my faults, I see my ups, my downs, my, I'm happy with myself, and then I'm not. He chooses to see the full and the complete and the finished picture. And what I love so much is I see finishing off that kneeling in front of that little one, I see now that little one in the father's arms and the arms around him. And he's safe and secure in the middle of that. What does that little one have to worry about? Remember when he lifted him up, you heard the giggle and the glee of the little guy as his father is looking into his face and he with that one. And I think that's how we should be. We should be so full of that, that childlike glee that we're not touched by the enemy because we're so enraptured in his shalom. We are so enveloped in, in all that we need because he's looking to our wholeness. He's looking to our completeness. He is looking to us to walk in contentment because every need has been met. And I'll ask you look hard and long in your life and tell me where God ever didn't do what you needed. God didn't let you down. You're the one who maybe walked away from God. You're the one who maybe went out into that desert or whatever. But where did God ever fail? Because we know God never fails. And if you're struggling with that right now, you just simply need to fall into those open arms. And yield into Him and allow Him to complete in you to fill you, to develop you, to guide you, to, to give you shalom in mind, in body, in a state, in every way. And we hear it in Isaiah, Yeshia 26.3, that will keep him in shalom, shalom, in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. If you really trust you are at peace because God takes care of it all. You get to cease. You don't have to figure it out. You don't have to work it up. He does it, and that's the key. He's blessing. All we do is receive. Don't cut off the blessing. Receive it. Be open to it. Because again, what is he imparting? He's imparting himself. That blows my mind. The God of creation, who's got billions of people through thousands of years, is imparting to me his very self. God's providing himself. That's what he's saying every time we hear this prayer. I'm providing me. I'm sharing you with me. I'm enveloping you with me. I'm loving you in that perfect love. And I think, oh, wow. Just go in that. Just go in that. That's supernatural. That's blessing us health, peace, welfare, safety, soundness, tranquil, prosperous, perfection, harmony. I hear the whole chorus coming together. Whoosh. That's our God. Because He put His name on it. And this is what God's name is. And it is done perfectly and completely. Wow. You have a high priest in heaven. You have Yeshua HaMashiach. He is higher than Aharon. The Kohen Gadol. He is after the order of Melchizedek. My God is, and my King is righteous. When we study His Word, when we really study His Word, He becomes intimate and it becomes personal. Scripture comes alive. That's why I tell you if you don't get something out of this book, you don't have the right relationship because you shouldn't be able to open any page without his love jumping out at you. That's his love letter to you. Open it. Don't leave it on the shelf. I think of the man in the, the uh, 
hole, you know, the ditch. ditch. Yeah, but what do they call it when they're at war? You know, they get into the trench. There's a simple word for it. You get my idea. He's in there hiding. He's, he's waiting to, to get an all clear to come out. He's got a few moments for himself. And his thoughts go back to his loved one. Oh, she wrote me a love letter. And he's probably got it memorized by now, but he pulls it out and he reads again because it gives him what he needs to go on, to, to fight another day. And the, the umph that he needs just knowing he's so loved. That's what that word does. It tells you, I love you so much. Get in my word and let me tell you how much I love you. Let it come alive. Let it drench you. Let it soak you because it is the living word of our living God. And that's why it's sharper than a two-edged sword. That's why it can pierce through the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow. It's able to judge the thoughts and the intents of the heart. What God is saying is, I get into the nitty-gritty with you. I know you on the inside. I know you better than you know yourself because I made you. You spend your whole life trying to figure out who you are and what you're like and what you need, and you think you're so smart. <laughs> it's a four-year-old trying to run the household. Really? <laughs> Put God in charge and feel his shield and his love and all that he's telling you and showing you. This is God revealing himself to you. Up front and personal. This is intimate, but this is experiential. He wants you to experience it. This isn't head knowledge. This isn't something you a formula you can memorize. This isn't something that's going to fit Chris the way it fits me. But it's going to be my personal experience with my Abba Father who loves me so much. And I go back through every picture I've drawn for you and every phrase that I've given to you. Wow. God has provided God. Read those promises. Get those blessings. Meditate on his word. Be conscious of what you are reading. Don't let your mind wander. Bring it back if it starts to. And let the word of God wash you, renew you, refresh you, illuminate you. Let it get you so excited you're ready to explode because somehow it keeps me from exploding even though I think I'm going to explode in a thousand pieces. <laughs> and yet the blood of shalom that you feel, that's why we can literally say when all you have is God, you finally realize that's all you need. There's nothing else. And there's nothing in this world that can even come close. And I hear God say, when you seek me with all your heart, you'll find me. Because remember, his face is looking towards you. In this way, they are to put my name on the people of Israel, and I will bless them. And I tell you, put your name in there. Because you might not be the children of Israel, but you come in through the shed blood to be his child. He says that you're his child, that you have a relationship with him. He's your father. So you can put your name in there. He put his name on you. That's our life. Jen is about to come do it for us, and it should remind us as we're here that everything God has done, everything he is doing, and trust him for everything he will do. Don't displease him with the spirit of unbelief, like our children of Israel at this time in our parasha, because he gives us no right, no reason. Look through time, from a dawn to June 16, 2023, and you will not find one word of failure from our God, who has gifted himself. And that's why we feel alive. That's why we can move and have our being when we're in his glory. My God. What a name. Janet, come give us our, our own blessing.
What a Father's Day gift. Isn't it? It's a perfect weekend. I, I didn't orchestrate that. He did. Mm -hmm. He did. So, to everyone. Well, she's right here. She's not the one. He's our Father. We can say Happy Father's Day yes. to our Father. It's every day, really. So much to ponder, isn't it? It is. In one verse. <laughs> In one verse. It is a lot to ponder. Every time I go through it, I get I get more excited. Yeah. <laughs> well, Chris, we're so happy you showed up. Yeah. Sorry I'm late. No. It's okay. Oh, wow. We've got your briefcase or whatever it oh, is. Oh, thank you. It's sitting yeah. out there yeah. waiting for you. So, I have chilled tangerine for you. Oh. Chilled strawberry. Yay. Well, thank you, Chris. And we have bagels for you. <laughs> <laughs> when you worry about being late, I hear Nate and Shalansky, you know, he had been in, uh, wasn't it Russia, wherever he was, prisoner, you know, for 15 years. He had sent his wife out knowing that they were coming for him. He wanted her to get out, and she just barely got out, and he got caught. And the last words he said to her is, you go first, I'll be right behind you. And it's 15 years later, and they're getting reunited in Israel. And Israel said, uh, the, the leaders in charge at the airport, they said, you know the media, they're all over it. They, you know, they, they want their time, but we're going to give you and your wife 15 minutes first in a room, and then we'll bring you out to the public. So he steps in his room, and there's his wife that he hasn't seen in so many years. What are you going to say? What's she going to say? And they literally sat there in 15 minutes of silence. Wow. Yeah. And at the last moment, when the talk was going to be over, he looked at her and says, Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so when you we said that, wouldn't you complain he was late? Pass it around. <laughs> oh, oh, nice. oh, no. Thank you very he much. was there. That's <laughs> all that matters. Yes, he's, he's right there. He's right there. I, I was very struck by that what you, one particular thing that you said was, when you think you have nothing, you think that's when you have nothing. I that's when you have And that's when you find out the thousands of I bet you go to me, I'm okay. sorry. <laughs>